is run through why we have a youth, why we're doing something different in youth, and what the rationale for that is. And I want to run through a bit about what, where we're up to, how we've designed it, and maybe have some chat with about what we should do next. That's okay, get your feedback on that. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist, which I think bears is, is relevant because a lot of the, what we're talking about in this youth service is, is a much more psychological, much more psychosocial, we call it, approach, much more about vocational stuff, about having meaningful contacts. So, and that, that's my natural territory, not so much brain science, which I don't know that much about. I was also um, on the task force, which I might talk a bit. So, this is the Children and Young People's Wellbeing and Mental Health Task Force, which was reported in March or something. So, I was on the task force, Norman Lab set it up. Looking, it was like a collection of experts, of which I was meant to be one, from all different backgrounds and lots of young people talking about what's wrong with our service and what the government should commission for the future. And what's exciting about that is that we're in the process now with all the commissioners and different people in Norfolk of putting in a bid for a couple of million quid to improve services around specific areas as long as it's in line with what the task force want. And what the task force want is what we're doing in Norfolk. We're the only place doing that, actually, in the country. What the world, actually. So, um, one of the hallmarks of this, I suppose, is it's less about tinkering with what was there already, less about trying to refine services and saying, well, we'll do more, we'll, just, we'll prescribe more Prozac, as Steve's here, or less Prozac, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's much more about taking it back to basics and thinking, what is the problem and how will we address the problem? And I was quite lucky with this. There's an organisation called the Clark in Cambridge, which a number of us now have worked with. And that's the combination of Cambridge University, which is fine, public health, so what's the public health need for any problem, the engineering design service, so engineers that look at systems and think, well, if you're going to build a rocket and make it fly, all these bits have to work, and you have to know where you're heading, and it has to all fit, otherwise it's not going to work there. If you're going to design a vacuum cleaner, people are going to want to use it, it has to, it has to be useful, otherwise, and what health services have always done is come up with ideas and just have a go with it, and actually nobody wants it. Or it doesn't really fit with what people want. So it's about trying to get around that. And, and the Management Institute, the Judges Management Institute. So a few of us have gone through this. Trying to look at a problem, this is Einstein, afresh. And one of the ways we've done that is to um, look at some of the facts. Um, we've got our own facts here, but our main facts, actually it's a shorter talk than I thought, can from look at the evidence. For about 10 years, young people's Advocates and charities, young minds, for instance, have been saying we don't like what you offer. It's not relevant to what we what we need, and that's said over and over again. And that was very critical of our services, of um, CAM services, under 18 services, and adult services for different reasons. So people, young adults, couldn't get into adult services for the reasons I've run through. And often, not always, but often, they say that well, the CAM service, which I attend is part of, but didn't really wasn't seen as relevant, it wasn't accessible, it wasn't there when they needed it, it didn't really fit. And it wasn't that the CAM's fault, but the model of trying to deliver care didn't really fit with what they wanted. They wanted something different, and they were very clear about what they wanted differently. So we looked at what they said, and then we did the same locally, and we've done the same, we looked at the literature, we've done lots of things, trying to think, well, what, what would you do, and are they asking for things which are unreasonable? And our take was it was entirely reasonable. You want, young people want certain things which were tried to put into this design. But Team C was our, one of my backgrounds as well as early intervention to psychosis. So that movement is trying to turn on its head the way we delivered care to people with psychosis by saying if you intervene early and effectively, and you spend a lot more money on it, to be fair, it will save you money down the line. And we, we've proved that. We've proved that it'll be half the cost down the line by having expensive services but knowing what they're doing and come up with a model to target that. Not all about drugs. It was about, a lot was about vocational input, getting you to college, getting you to university, getting you work, getting you something, getting you friendship networks, specific psychotherapies for everyone that needs them, not just 1% of people that need them. But if you do that, if, and systematically, most people get a lot better than they were before. I mean, almost recovered, actually, for most people. So 60% of our young people be completely normal. You could be at medical school, you could be doing whatever you're doing, and you, most people get back on their course if you've got a psychotic illness. Some people don't still, and those are the bits we're still doing studies trying to refine why not and, and what, what's wrong there. 
One of the problems is that by the time you can become psychotic, hearing voices or deluded or thinking aliens are outside poisoning you, then you've actually been struggling for, on average, four years, dropping out of school and losing your social connections and being more isolated. And it's very hard then to, four years on, get back to where you would have been on a sort of social line. Does that, that make sense? So if you, the earlier you can catch somebody before they're psychotic even, then that, that, that would be the theory. Then you could maybe nudge people back and support them in getting back to where they should be in terms of functioning, not symptoms, functioning. It's all very nice and we've got to prove it and then we've got to prove it to save some money, which we're starting to do. But that was the kind of background for all this. And Team C was our 14 to 18 year old service for the psychotic team, the psychosis team. Now that worked with CAM services as in, in Norfolk, lots of areas gave up with trying to work with CAMs because they couldn't, the models were so different that they, they couldn't do it. We didn't, in Norfolk we carried on and it worked pretty well. And we looked at young people and we looked at kind of what was wrong with them. You can't really see this. But what it shows, the first one is psychotic symptoms. And most young people you'd expect to have, this is persistent psychotic symptoms, we measure all this, but certainly brief psychotic symptoms, hearing voices, quite enough to be distressed by it. That's why they're seeking help. But what they also have is psychological distress, 65%, risks to, to themselves, 40%, problems with substance misuse, problems with physical health, limited data activities, poor social contact. So the, you can treat the voices by giving antipsychotic medication, but you're not necessarily addressing any of that by giving the tablets. And actually the early dementia model would go further and say if we improve your social contacts and lower your psychological distress by, by helping you manage the voices, this goes down. And we know that's true. That would be the basis for CBT for psychosis. We can treat the psychotic symptoms, but without the tablets. Well, alongside the tablets, maybe lower doses of the tablets and, and using those in a more sophisticated way, but not relying on that as the main intervention. And now, can the outcome from this? Because the most young people were discharged after about six months back to their GP. So these are young people who are, you know, are the most severely ill in some ways, they're, they're the psychotic bunch of young people. But not just discharged GP, the plan of early intervention will be you're discharged but able to look after yourself better. You kind of know about how to manage yourself, that's the focus of the intervention. And if you become distressed or you're worried about yourself, you know how to access help pretty, pretty quickly. I'll come on to that for young people because that's quite important which if you get into it, you get a lovely three year service. But if you don't get into it, you're a young person with quite severe mental health problems, really good, but you're not quite psychotic enough for the early prevention service. So you have the normal service. And that is quite distressing if you're in that you know, specialist, quite a slick team, really. It's a big research team. Because you say, well, what's gonna to happen to these young people? They're gonna to have to find their way through our, this is going back for years, traditional services. If you're over 18, you're presenting, imagine that graph, with a range of problems to an adult service. You're not saying, I'm depressed. Can you treat my depression, please? And we say, oh yeah, there's your Prozac. Get better, off you go. You're saying, I'm self-harming, I'm taking drugs, I've got no friends, I'm very distressed, or I can't sleep at night because I'm worrying all the time. What are you gonna do for me? And I'm quite depressed, but not enough for the Prozac to just do the job. Our services weren't really set up for that so much in adult psychiatry. And neither were the developmentally appropriate adult psychiatrists. So people are still, as I'll come on to, developing and evolving as people. You don't even stop when you're 17, you know, it carries on. And our services didn't really cater for that. And for different reasons, young people in the, in the under 18 service might get a different, less of a team sort of structure like intervention, I suppose, team ethos. So we thought, well, we'll try and catch these young people that bit earlier for the reasons I just said. And to that, we'll develop this youth service. And it's gone on and on and on. It's grown from this idea. And this started quite a number of years ago. It started with, oh yeah, one other thing to say is that there's lots of other agents, not just us, that deals with young people's mental health, is it? It's families, it's MAP, or MIND, or uh, scouts, or teachers. They're all involved in looking after young people's mental health. And we, we're these sort of experts, which if you're severe, you get the expert. If you're not severe, you know, we're not interested. That's the way you can see. So people are sort of struggling, not knowing what to do and how to access help. So we sat down with MAP, and I apt as it was, and well, I read CAMS people, and a range of agents said, well, supposing if, if someone in CAMS was worried about somebody, 
or wanted more support for MAP, how, how would they get that? Well, if somebody at MAP, which is a young people's charity locally, wanted, was worried about a young person, at the time they would have to get the young person to go to their GP to get a reference so that they'd have to articulate the problem. The GP has to translate the problem into language that captures our attention. Uh, we sit at a team meeting, we decide who we take on and who we don't, and that also happens as well. And say, no, no, it doesn't meet the cut for us. We suggest you do this, and we see a small proportion of those referrals in. And on each of those steps, the young person sort of falls through the cracks because the, the, they've got to go and tell the GP what's wrong with them in a way which makes sense in, in, in a health language, if you like, not a not just a normal developing, and I'm not I'm going off the rails and don't know why, which is how it feels if you're 18. Not good, right? So we try to, well, just imagine if MAP could just see one of the CAMS doctors just because they're worried. And there's a fear we'll be overwhelmed as a service, but maybe that won't happen. So we come up with these principles, which we've largely stuck to. The first form is we wanted something to be youth oriented, like the only to try to be, but much more so. So young people would see it as relevant and appealing. We didn't have to do that, but that's what we want to do. It's not stigmatizing, so we would change the whole cultural thing around that as well. So it's not, I had a phone call yesterday from someone. Yeah, I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you about that now. So she um, still, some at the university gets, loses a bit of confidence over the summer, no problems ever in his life before 20 or something, goes back to university, and then comes back the next day, I can't cope with this, I'm just, and, and he's sitting there, I've never seen him like this, he's just looking at the floor, when I asked him how he was, he burst into tears, I don't know what's going on, I don't you know, he wouldn't speak, I don't know what's going on with this, with him. Now for us, you think, oh, it'll be fine, we'll get you better. But I've got to trust the system to get him better. And where he would go, and, and then really clearly say, well, this is what you do, and this is what happened next, and this is likely what's going to happen to get him better, and he will get better. But she, what she's worried about is actually, He's not going to go and talk to any old person and pour his heart out. So it needs to be, it's got to be the right person who goes through that first time, otherwise you're going to get nowhere. Can he come and see me, please? Because he thinks I can talk to him. Um, he can't, we could, but he can't really, because it's, you know, it's, it's not how it works, our system. But I need confidence that whoever he does go and see will talk to him properly and in the right place, at the right time, and he'll feel comfortable enough to stunt me. Yeah, this person's going to be helpful to me. That's the bit we have to be getting right. So hence the youth origin is non similar that's, that's the, probably the most important bit. What about specialists? That's us. Recovery focused, so not symptom focused, recovery focused is what we aim to be. So it's not about getting your, you know, your, how many, you know, well actually people do hear voices, but how depressed you are from this point on a scale to this point on a scale. It's about getting you functioning back again with the belief that, in the recovery model, if you're going out and seeing friends, if you've got something to get up in the mornings, if you're doing these things, your mental health is going to improve. You've got to believe in that as, as, it, as your prime intervention. The tablet might help you do that, but that's what we're trying to get you to do, is to function socially effectively. Risk management is um, intervention. One of the reasons they were successful is that they had the time, to be fair, to work out with a young person about risk. risk we're obsessed with risk as our service. We don't want people to certainly kill themselves, obviously, but we may have a lot of false positive calls and we do a lot of damage by sticking people in hospital for six months until they're not risky, by which point six months of your life has gone and to be recovery focused is quite difficult if you've had six months, I don't know, in Sussex in a hospital somewhere. Um, so it's quite, so we're trying to avoid that, but to get that right, we've got to really work with the young person. EI's is quite good at doing that, at trying to say, we won't admit you, but we'll do all these things instead. We'll work with your family, we'll, do, we'll give your family therapy, we'll do all these things to try to manage this and make sense of this risk, actually. What you're saying is, what would it take to feel more secure at home? How are we going to achieve that? It, it is somewhat assertive in its approach, so if we need to, we will chase people up, because some of this group are going nowhere without somebody doing something. We want to reduce admissions, not because they're expensive, but because for most people, we don't think they're particularly productive. And that's young people talking about that. We didn't say that. They, this is what they said to us. I'll come on to that. Diagnostic uncertainty is from early intervention. So we don't, you don't come and see me and I say, great, you've got bipolar disorder. It's a lifelong condition. Off you go and live with it. It's much more about, because at this point, we don't know. You've got moods which are all over the place, as do lots of young people. 
it may or may not be bipolar disorder. So what we're going to have to, if I diagnose, this is my tip, if I diagnose you too early, then you're left with a condition. And every time you kick off at home because you're angry, your mum says it's your condition, not, not you. You feel there's nothing you can do about your condition because it's a brain chemical thing, not some, but in fact, true bipolar disorder is a lot to do with managing yourself socially and psychologically. That's one of the core things. Tablets are definitely important. So about diagnosing things, when we're sure that's what it is, and if we're not sure, try to help the young person figure out what's going on. So we, did, we might we had a pilot for this. The young people come say, I think I've got bipolar, which is quite common now. We hear that. My mood's all over the place. My mum says that you're, you're manic depressive. <coughs> I said, well, you don't meet the criteria. I had loads of diagnose you now. But what you need to do is do this little program of work you have with an occupational therapist, and you read about bipolar, keep them in the diary of your moods, figure it out, and come back and tell us if you think it's bipolar disorder. And all of them, in this thing we did, would come back as, I don't think it is. I think there's other things I should be doing first to manage my mood disorders. Um, one of them, two years later, phoned me up and said, Gone high, I've gone properly high. So I'm not saying it's not, I'm saying it probably isn't, but you won't really know for five years. And when it does happen, you need this is what you need to do and why. And if that would happen, I'd be thrilled. So self management, optimizing for the support agencies, I'm, I'll maybe come on to, but that's not about, we, we don't fix the problem. The problems that the young people I see are largely social, to do with upbringing, to do with education, to do with vocation. We don't fix any of those things and support day to day. But there are lots of people out there, including families, obviously, that can do that, and are better at that. So we have to be accessible and link with them as freely as possible. And, and vice versa, someone like Mint, you know, the Back to Work for Young People uh, charity, if they're aware of that, they should have access to our advice as quickly as possible if we're expecting them to work, do some things for us. And using uh, an evidence base where it exists, there isn't much. And if, and if there isn't evidence base, trying to research it and develop an evidence base with young people. So that went on a bit, didn't it? This is busy as well, don't worry, but the, the, this is from Pat McGorry, whose idea is Australian psychiatrist, set of early intervention. So I'm seeing Pat next week, actually, but he's very keen on this. But one of the things he points out is this bit, these two lines here. So friends and family and the young people are using a service for the first time. That will, that will dictate how they and their families respond to the system from then on, whether they'll engage with it or not. So this first contact, the feel of it, is important. And also treatment naive even more sensitive to it, says the atrogenic. So that's, that's us doing things, particularly as doctors, which might cause more problems than they solve. Not just with side effects of medication, but giving a diagnosis when it, we're not sure, then we have the young person to live with it. And then this is all sort of early intervention. So what do we do? So um, in that pre-pilot, this is from five years ago, we, I came across Rachel, who, um, I don't know how I met Rachel now, but she was one of the first young people, I'd done all these bits of research, I was doing all this research about what the, what the charity said and all that, it was reading about it, and she helped us think, well, if we were to set up a service, what would it look like? So she wrote pages for this, and said, well, you design it, you tell us what it, thinking, I don't, I don't know what she came back with, actually. She came back with this, she'd been in hospital, but she came back with this very sensible approach to what she would have wanted when she first got ill that she thinks might have made a difference now. She would say to that, Annie, started getting better when I left, when I left hospital. She went, went to, a, to stay somewhere for recovery work, and that's what got me better. For years in hospital, she's not sure what that was all about. But so she wrote lots and lots of actually very, very sensible guidance as to what the services should look like for young people, in line with what they would engage with and what, they, what should happen next. And it didn't talk much about doctors and tablets. It talked a lot more about support and peer support, first points of contact, and then what could be added to that. Um, but she wrote a lot, I'm going to tell you, she wrote lots and lots, really, really sensible. And she helped us set up a pilot from there. So she helped us and we all designed this service. This is still really what it looks like. So I'll kind of talk you through it and then come on to some of the background to it a bit more. It's gone through different iterations, but at the moment, and this is what we're aiming for. So as of this month, we've got the Norfolk Wellbeing Service re relaunched. 
as we wanted in the first place. This is a youth focused, so 16 it's commissioned for, to 25 service. I'm hoping it will be run from open, so it won't be mental healthy. I'm hoping that it will, well it will, have a range of levels of intervention, largely psychological, lots of support, lots of self-management, and it's around well-being, staying well, but right through to relatively ill people, which we as a service will support. So if they're worried about anybody, which is different than it was before, it used to be if you're in the well service, you couldn't see me because you were, you were having therapy only. And the rules, the commissioning rules, it wasn't this trust, made it nonsense, really. So if you're too risky, you couldn't get the therapy there. And we didn't really have much therapy here. The thing was in balance. So we would support them with assessing people if they're worried or adding interventions. But one of the jobs of all of the youth service, the youth wellbeing service, would be support the system around us. Particularly high risk groups of people. So looked after children, in social care services, or people in dis social distress. Um, so non statutory agencies, MAP and MIND, and all, a range of agencies actually. And statutory things like probation services, youth offending teams, obviously there's lots of distressed young people, it tends to be where the men go, um, and trying to link more closely with what they're offering. So the purpose of, ideally, if we can either detect people with long-term problems, or support them doing what they're doing anyway, because they could be better at it, then it helps the whole system make sense. Does that help okay? Then we'd have crisis teams. We'd like alternatives to hospital for young people. We'd like not, you know, like um, maybe a mind or someone like that, or lots of agencies that could run. So it's not a hospital, but it's a place you get more support, and it's and you know it's that. You don't you're not going to get treated. You don't get fixed. You're going to get more support, and it's overt. We have inpatient units. So the aims of it, let's go back to this, are to actively engage our bit <coughs> of young people at high risk of long-term mental health problems. We think it's both cost-effective, hence commissioners like it. And we think that actually it's going to pay big social dividends down the line. That's the aim of the service. But the youth well-being bit will be actively trying to recruit as many people as possible, ideally on the internet, ideally with web, lots of web-based resources you know, um, across the system, um, to get people well to engage in the well-being service, prevent admissions, and to link with community resources as a kind of model for social recovery. So it's a sort of social recovery model. One of the other reasons we've gone for it is a 14 to 25 year old youth service. One of the reasons for that is the problem which you might come across of transitions. What you get until you're 18, what, 17, and when you're 18, changes quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the feel of it, the culture of it, and actually getting into it is are very, very different. And we know that from our own service. We know this from national, international studies. But this is our own service in uh, 2010. We've just repeated this which I don't have the graph for, but we've got a poster about that presenting. So these are contacts, uh, these are referrals into our service. So this is 17 year old, 18, 19, 20, and you can see that they, you know, 600 a year, and they're just, gee, this is GPs at the time, refer, largely referring people and saying that this person needs your service. And these are the contacts the person has as a proxy for intervention, just as you saw. So you can see if you're 15, lots of contacts, 16, lots of contacts, so when you should leave the CAM service, your actual ability to be seen by the service halves. So only half the people that someone says needs a service have been uh, having contacts when you're 18. So there are lots and lots of problems around this transition point. And there are problems that it's not just us, it happens in, in social services and education, lots of things. That's why things change then. You can certainly treat like an adult then, and young people would sort of say that some CAM services nationally would treat them too much like a child then which most fluffy toys in and children's drawings and why am I going to go there? Um, the, the way we've got it now is it's actually, this has come down a bit, so all the contacts are less, which is probably the model, but it, it carries straight across. So there's, you would expect if you have a 14 to 25 year old, so you don't, you don't have a big drop off at 18. But that's what's highlighted. So, so the youth pilot was, um, before we had this, we had to practice it for the trust just to see if we'd get, if we got this model right, if it, if it was going to work. And we were told to take, in our language, cluster five, so very severe mental illness and above, um, to reduce hospital admissions, which we did. But what we did also was measure and look at the young people. This is, this is just a backup, and this informs the model. This sort of research bit informs, well, how do we do what we do? So there's about 300 young people that came into this pilot across Norfolk. 
So all of them said they were depressed. Most of them said they were very depressed, which is not what we would think looking at them. So either shows the Beck's depression inventory is, doesn't measure the same thing, or that if young people feel bad, they feel really, really, really bad, which is probably true as well. So, you know, for an objective adult stance, you wouldn't say you're very depressed, but they yeah. self raise themselves as severely depressed. But what they also did was, on a different measure, this is social anxiety. So, which we didn't really talk about, actually, at adult services we didn't talk about. So, you know, 80% of young people said they've got significant social anxiety. If you think about a social recovery model, which says without friends, a meaningful activity, and doing pleasurable activities, and exercise, you're highly likely to have mental health problems, anxiety, depression, the rest of it. And you've got massive social anxiety, so peer anxiety and going to groups. You're never going to get the recovery bits in place because you're too anxious to stop them off doing it. And there's actually one of our biological psychiatric CAMS colleagues said, you know, the Prozac is not going to get them better unless it works specifically for social anxiety because all, the, all these other things aren't happening to reinforce and help someone get their life back on track. So one of the things we think specifically about is what we, you know, measuring, assessing that, and trying to treat the social anxiety to get the social recovery to happen. Does that, that make sense? And then just briefly about, um, it's all anonymized, but of this severe group, this is the se more severely ill, the vast majority describe self-reported significant trauma histories, either emotional abuse, which is serious bullying, sexual abuse of 40%, high, you know. And these are all things, lots of w knife, physical violence and, and knife, forced to have sex with a knife, and really the dramatic stuff they're reporting, which we don't normally talk about. But that informed, obviously, you're going to be socially anxious if that's happened to you. So the whole thing sort of snowballs, doesn't it? So we've got to think of a clinical model which takes us all into account. Going back to the social recovery bit, 56% were doing nothing with their time, nothing at all with their time. And to do something productive on this time use measure, which is the Office of National Statistics measure, the average for young people is 64 hours a week. So they're doing nothing at all with their time. No housework, no childcare, no college, no nothing. So again, if you think of social recovery, it's a bit of a, a challenge, and it must be impossible for them to go from nothing to suddenly expecting to be 65 hours of meaningful activity, and then I'll be happy. That's, so our model is going to be, thinking, well, how do we tweak that? They're doing very, very little. We've got a specific trial here on now to look at this. Okay. So a couple of other things to say. What the other, the other reason for 25 was the theory that biologically, your frontal lobes, you know, the bit of your brain that moderates just your emotional world and makes sense of it and helps you process it, doesn't fully develop until your mid twenties. And your emotional lobes, your limbic system, start to develop quite highly when you're about 14 upwards. So that's called being a teenager. You've got lots of emotion and not a lot of frontal blow, which is this higher human stuff to just moderate it. So that's roughly where I've gone for this patch. And we have to obviously tailor it. If you're 14 and you're 23, you can get something different, but it has to be developmentally appropriate as best we can. And Tanya and I work in lots of people trying to tailor that. The service as it stands now, this is, we have, um, we have data. We have the, so imagine there's a youth wellbeing bit up there. It's at open. It's, I'd like it on every bus. I'd like it to be um, across the internet. You type it into your mental health, and it will flash up through a paid advert, because it knows you're in Norfolk. This is what you do. You type in self-harm. It puts up as a paid thing. And it will guide you through not just our service, but all the services around, with video blogs to make it appealing, or as best we can, designed by young people to make it an appealing website, not a trust website, which is, has its own governance issues, but something sort of done differently which will guide you if necessary to well-being. If necessary, they can say, well, actually, we need your help as a youth service. And as a youth service proper at H.S. and Stevens, or at the coastal things there, we have a sort of more child and family focused up to 14 bit. We have, a, we have an infant bit, actually, as well. But the youth service we've just talked about, we still have the intervention psychosis service, although, interestingly, remember that pilot data I talked, I talked about? About 85% of young people who are not in our psychosis service self-report hearing voices. And about half of the case managers say, oh, yeah, we, they do hear voices. There's, and hearing voices itself, we're doing something with Cambridge again, 
is probably just a marker of distress. The more distressed you get, if you're young particularly, you, these experiences start to happen more. The less distressed, they go away again. So the psychosis service is looking, we're trying to figure out how that deals with the schizophrenia end, so it's a persistent psychosis, but also this hearing voices which is distressing. We've got an eating disorder service, which Tanya wants for. Currently up to 18, but that will be recommissioned a couple of 18 months or something. And we've got, we're trying to get off the ground a sort of a, a common pathway for ADHD and Asperger's. So we have a common language. When I started, ADHD didn't exist for adult psychiatry, but in CAMS, child psychiatry is probably the most common referral. So how can it be that at 18, we don't even look for it, and at 17, that's most of what the doctors are doing? So the idea was to try to stream that all together so it fitted. And actually, you know, we start to recognize, actually, this is probably ADHD. And the intervention isn't just medication. The intervention is a lot of psychology, potentially, or assistant, assistant practitioners, so support worker work. So it's not about tablets. So the idea is, and I've got other charts which I haven't shown you, but when that person that knows me phones about her son, I know what to do, which I don't entirely at the moment. Wellbeing should help me with that. So rather than say you could try them and try them and try them and try them and they won't talk to them and they won't talk to them, it's pretty obvious. And better still, she knows what to do because she can just look it up. And the GPs don't know what to do. They know what to do. So everyone just knows what to do. And it all kind of fits together. We are supporting a wider system. We look after the most severe people, but we're finding them in other places where I'm, next, where I'm hoping they don't get referred because we're overwhelmed. And we're resourced enough to do it. But also, you know, through the well, youth well-being, through social care, through MAP, that these bits all place up. So this could be MAP, this could be social services, this could be a teacher at school. It all sort of fits under a common pathway for young people's mental health. And the good news about that is, I talked about the, the transformation plan and the future in mind from the task force. So there's a lot of pressure from this government just adopted it to say the system for young people, particularly under 18, but up to 25 as well, just doesn't work. You know, this doesn't work for anyone's fault. It's badly commissioned. There's bits of pockets of money. It doesn't link up. You will put this straight. And Norfolk is, by some measure, ahead of the game. Not just us, but the commissioners are on board with this. Social care, education, as far as we can raise with them. Uh, the voluntary sector, trying to trying to come up with a common pathway. So it's pretty clear what you're going to get from who. <laughs> and if you come to the wrong part of the service, you guide you to the right part, rather than be told you're in the wrong part. So that's the. Um, I've talked for long, I said, didn't I? That's a 15 minute talk. Um, that's the short version of what the youth service is. Um, but I'm quite happy to get your feedback. It's not what we want it to be. I can't, I can't stress that enough. This is not. But it's, it's starting to really get momentum amongst the wider system. We know we want it to be better. We think we know how. We have youth council. We have lots of young people trying to guide us to what's wrong with it. We ask everyone that uses the service to what's right and wrong with the service. Very few tell us, which is a bit annoying. Um, you, you, we, want, we ask people that don't use the service, what would you want if you did use the service? We're trying to get this sorted, but it's, it's a big job because there's lots of players and lots of money at the state. You've got to shift the money around a bit. But I'm happy to answer any questions or thoughts. Anybody? What do you think of this as an idea? I just wish it would be about 10 years ago.